This is our item number nine on water. And just while Andrew makes his way up, I just would like to take a, a moment to link together this water discussion document, our climate change report, and our sediment strategic approach. And it would be really useful as governors if we could be holding these three issues in our head in a strategic way, thinking about the impact of climate change on our on our water, our fragile water cycle in the Auckland region, and the impact of climate change, of course, on sediment, the impact of our approach on sediment, on how we treat water, and the importance of our land-based activities, not only on climate change, but on water and sediment. Sorry if that's a little bit too much for everybody on a, on a Tuesday morning, but unless we hold the threads of this tightly, we risk doing all of these marginally. So I hope people are engaged so is the, uh, on that. Is the water presentation so I'll now yeah, the sediment one by accident? easy to get them mixed up. So Andrew, I'll hand over to you, welcoming our diverse team that we've got with us. Nice to see your smiling face again, our Viv. And, um, <laughs> so uh, thank you, Aaron. I'd like to um, welcome up to the, uh, the table with me, uh, Viv Heslop from Auckland Transport, Dave Allen from Natural Environment Strategy, and Anna Nama from Watercare. And I'd uh, just like to emphasise that um, Water Care, Transport and the Strategy Department have all contributed people to help write the, the discussion document as it is today. So we really tried to make it a collaborative effort uh, across the council group. Um, so thank you for your time. I'm going to whistle through the um, presentation because it is quite a, a long document and give you plenty of time for questions afterwards. Oops. But the... Uh, what we've prepared um, for your consideration today is uh, a discussion document. It's a text-only version. And the, uh, the purpose of the, co the discussion document for public engagement is to uh, yeah, inform the public about the issues, establish the values framework for the National Policy Statement Work Programme, discover stakeholder views, and uh, set the framework for the next steps in developing the strategy proper. So I'd just like to emphasise it's a discussion document, high level, that we are going to <coughs> start to get the, um, the views of the broader public at this high level and somewhat, I guess, a, a quite agreeable document at, at the level it is. Um, as you see, the, the topic of water is very broad and we are advanced at different stages, um, like you saw for the, the work that Dave's team has done on sediment. There's a lot of detail being done and Dave's team also looked at about over 70 work programs that the council is doing already. But we've got different levels of maturity and different aspects of the water cycle. So to start with, um, we set the vision, and we're proposing the vision, <coughs> the Te Māori o Te Wai o Tamaki Makaurau, the life supporting capacity of Auckland's waters is protected and enhanced. And that vision comes from the advice of the uh, Mana Whenua Kaitiaki Forum and surrounding their vision are the five values. And uh, the presentation today is just giving you a little bit of a taster of some of the graphics that have been worked up that will illustrate the document um, that we propose in the new year. The values of ecosystems, water use, culture, recreation and amenity, and of course going across everything is resilience, and I guess this is where the connection through to uh, John's work on the Auckland Climate Action Plan. If you take a water focus, you'll see climate impacts are peppered throughout the document, and likewise when you take a climate focus, as in the Climate Action Plan, you'll see uh, water features peppered throughout um, their work as well. And when we look at the, uh, the issues, there are a number of key stresses and some you've already heard about today. Obviously sediment when it comes to ecosystem, the nutrients, contaminants, heavy metals, pathogens, erosion. Um, these are all very familiar to you, but the, uh, the document here we are saying it's, it's this high level thing to get agreement on the values that we work to before we embark on those more confrontational and controversial approaches of setting stronger rules, limits, <coughs> objectives, allocations. 
Likewise, in the recreational space, Safe Swim has really highlighted um, to the community the quality of our water, and we can see the, uh, the stresses that have been put on that contribute to these problems, and they're long-term problems that will take a long time to fix. Now, um, um, tabled today with the report is the local board view, so I apologise that we couldn't get it onto the agenda, but um, we literally received the last of the board feedback due to the meeting timetables. And the, uh, we, we've, uh, the local boards didn't get the benefit of seeing the full discussion document, but they saw the high-level framework the description of the vision, the values, the issues and the processes we need to work on. And uh, that's a bit of a sample of the, uh, the feedback we got there. But um, probably not surprising, some of the um, themes that were coming out was setting a higher priority for the Manukau. Um, you heard that today from the Manukau Harbour Forum. Mm -hmm. um, Waitemata and Mangakiki Tamaki mentioned the DIA review and um, that they had strong views about government taking control of the Three Waters infrastructure from local government. Um, there's also a lot of commentary around growth in the right places. Um, is our existing infrastructure capable of you know, receiving the intensification without further impacts? Sedimentation growing in areas of um, flood risk and vulnerability. And just as a quick reminder, we worked on, we, we'd synthesised the multitude of issues in around water into these four big groups, cleaning up our waterways, meeting our future water needs, growth in the right places, adapting to a changing water future. And below those in the list are some of the, the issues that we see within those, within those broad categories. Processes we need to work on. Creating our water future together. And within that, I see things like you know, increasing our compliance and monitoring. I mean, so much about what we have to monitor and do compliance for is because people need to take uh, their share of the personal responsibility for the outcome. Uh, setting our priorities for investment. Um, these are very long-term and very expensive projects. And some of the difficult conversations that will come are, will be around what do we prioritise and when, and we've already heard today you know, there's a lot of investment going in the Western Isthmus. What about other areas in the Manukau, for example? And I guess they're achieving net benefits for catchments. And within this, we're, we're talking about the future conversations that we may need to have about allocation, um, perhaps trading, water rights, the right to discharge, the right for water from an aquifer, um, taking a catchment-wide view to, to balance the effects of discharges, enabling discharges in one part of the catchment if we can get a better outcome by reducing discharges in another part of a catchment, for example. And underpinning all of this, if we put te Māori o te wai at the top, we have to apply a Māori worldview throughout. Finally, there's a number of principles that we establish about how we work. And these principles, um, those who went to the workshops will be familiar, we've developed from the water sensitive urban design principles and the heavily influenced by the American one water approach. And they're really there to sit there and look at how we work to implement these changes. So broadly speaking, in the next steps, if the committee uh, approves the uh, document for public engagement, we'll be looking to engage alongside the annual plan. Um, we're doing that for efficiency purposes, to make best use of uh, people's time and leverage off those Have Your Say events and the Have Your Say, Have Your Say websites. Um, we're looking to do an Auckland Conversations over the month of March, which will be like a water-themed month, and World Water Day is on the Friday the 22nd of March. So we look to receive the, uh, the feedback from that public engagement um, and develop really the programme of, of, of works for to, to lock in for June 2019. And if I was to characterise, we've been in the sort of untangle and organise phase. We'll start the early engagement, establish those values in the framework for working forward. And then over the next financial year, really look to do the analysis and the evidence to develop those strategic scenarios and options and move into some of those more controversial and difficult conversations so that we can establish the strategy 
that will guide the decisions for the next long-term plan and also influence the unitary plane changes that will be required for the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. So uh, that's what I've put forward for the presentation. I'll leave the floor open for questions. Thank you. Okay. So questions would be good, and just while people prepare those in their head, the key thing for us is to make sure that we are asking the right searching questions, that we are asking Aucklanders the kind of questions that will help guide these incredibly <coughs> difficult discussions, rather than looking at, you know, it's not all about the content, it's like, are we giving people enough information to really engage with this and ask the hard questions that need to be asked, you know? So, starting off, Councillor Wayne Walker. Sure. Um, just got a, a question, and it's it's just around the um, content. I note that you've got a number of case studies, and the case studies are really great. Uh, they're essentially applying in part to the situation now. But given that this is an enabling piece of work, is it possible to have some examples, um, say, if we assume that this integrated approach might encourage, for example, water tanks, and that those water tanks add to resilience as it goes to civil defence, go to mitigating stormwater and other things, that might be an example. Um, another example might be taking the stormwater out of a stream that's running through a park and using it to irrigate the playing fields on the park and conceivably other uses. So. Just showing some examples so that an Aucklander looking at this can see what an integrated approach, because this is essentially an integrated approach, does. I just toss that in. Is that possible, Andrew? Um, through the Chair. I guess we're, we're walking a balance here. That we're not trying to set a policy or a direction just yet, but we do want to foreshadow some of the controversial and difficult um, choices to come. So. Um, I definitely take on board your feedback that um, we could be emphasising some of the uh, more difficult choices more strongly through the use of examples. So I, I don't see um, we can certainly the water tanks certainly are in there, but we can bring them to the fore through the use of um, examples as a technique. I'm, I'm sure we could do that. Distracted for a moment. I had my answer, Madam Chair. You had your answer. Okay. It was yes. Just, just hang on a sec. I'm just dealing with the last bit Councillor Philip Iner asked me to do, yep. and then we'll go to the Apologies. next question. <coughs> Councillor Philip Iner. Uh, just, just one question, Andrew. On your slide, uh, processes we need to work on. Um, on, on, on that particular slide, but also uh, referring to this particular document and under values and 19 local boards agreed to proposal, but there were some that uh, asked for following topics to be included. What work uh, has happened in regards to possibly looking at this? I know it's going to have to public consultation, so, you know, I mean, and it's important in regards to the views from the local boards. Uh, so. Uh, many of the local board's comments are already um, yep. within the in the yes. document, but there are some that there are certainly gaps. And like I say, we literally received the uh, <laughs> the, the feedback as late as yesterday. So I think within the delegations um, cool. to the chair, we can um, try and bring those in. And, and like, like I um, said to uh, Councillor Walker, there is a balance here about um, it is a discussion document. It's not setting policy yet, yeah. but we want to foreshadow some of those more controversial things enough. And, and it, that, I think that's the hard part for us is um, we have written a very agreeable document that um, I guess everyone can sign up to, but as elected members you can perhaps um, encourage us to put more emphasis and take steps into those uh, more controversial areas. Thank you. I think just in response, Councillor Filipina, and I, you know, seeing that you and I will have <coughs> the editorial pen on this, what we really need from our yeah. colleagues is a steer. My, my 
personal view and when I met with the staff after reading the agenda, I think we've gone a little bit gently. Um, I Probably my view on water is one of the most radical around the table and I, I'm happy to hose that down. But I think we, my gut feeling is that we probably need to be a little bit more provocative on some of these issues around the fact that we are a water-stressed city. I know you'll say, just look outside the window, you silly woman, but we are a water-stressed city. We've got huge issues of growth that are raised with us daily, and I think we need to strengthen that in here. We also need to be a bit braver in what the alternatives are, and I know we work respect respectfully with our partners, but when push comes to shove, this is on behalf of the people for Auckland, you know, to be dealt with um, in, a, in a way that looks agnostically across who delivers what and how. So I, my gut feeling is we probably could strengthen one or two of those areas, so I'd be interested in your feedback. Councillor Bartley. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for your, um, your work on this. Um, I just, uh, it, it seems to me like we're seeking validation with this document. So I'm just wondering, um, what was the point of the, the questions? You know, like, um, how concerned are you about these issues? Does, you know, what was the point of asking that kind of question and what relevance does it have to this whole document? And do you think we're being too airy fairy? Are you satisfied with this approach of just looking at values, um, or should we just go the other way and tell them how bad it is and this is what we're going to do about it? Uh, through the chair, so I think um, the, the purpose of the questions, firstly, is to get people thinking. So what became apparent to us through through the engagements that we did that um, a lot of understanding about water in Auckland is at various levels. There's a lot of people who, who don't understand that um, Auckland isn't self-sufficient in water, that we that we get over 60% of our water from another region, for example. So we know it's a, lot, a large purpose of the document is to inform and the questions are there to get people asking the questions in their own mind as they read, to start thinking about water as a system, the interconnectedness of it, and the complexity. Because if you can burrow down on one issue, you can get some um, very particular points of view, but it has a knock-on effect. And maybe I'll use the example of the top of my head, like sediment today. We can take a very strict focus on sediment controls and push the dial really hard but we've got a housing crisis. There's going to be 30 years of greenfield development happening in the next however many months, and so there's a very difficult um, values to balance. And so part of starting at the high level where we can agree is to set the framework and to set the values so that we can begin to have those more difficult conversations. So if we agree on the outcomes and we agree on the values and the processes and the way that we'll work, when we get into those harder territories uh, where people have very strongly held views about the approach to water, I mean, there's, there's, we don't see eye to eye as a council group in how we manage um, water between us at all times. So part of this is to set a framework so we can start to move into those more difficult territories. Um, I, I, w I want also want to ask, because this is set on um, applying the Māori world view, so uh, how can we incorporate the Māori world view at an operational level, not just advisory, um, to, you know, so that the whole thing that we do is, you know, um, respecting, acknowledging Māori? Cool. I don't have all the answers to that, but I think we are going a long way towards that. Um, I think um, if I reflect the, the Kaitiaki Forum's advice to me in putting Te Māori or Te Wai at the centre, for example, um, the, they said there's, there's 19 mana whenua around the table and we don't agree on a lot of things, but we all can uh, unify around the concept of improving the Māori of water. Um, 
entering into partnership in, in a true sort of co-governance style approach. And, um, and, and, I, and actually I might reflect some of the subject matter experts' feedback as well. Um, so project engineers from Auckland Transport and NZTA really welcome the mana whenua input because often water quality aspects will be value engineered out of a transport project um, early on if it weren't for the, uh, the treaty partnership and the role that mana whenua have in influencing the, uh, the options and the design decisions that get made right at that working level. So I think there's a couple of examples and there's room for improvement, but I think the, um, the holistic view of the water cycle and um, treating water as a treasure sits very well with taking an integrated and holistic view for water that's in, that's, that we're trying to establish here. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. Very, very good questions. We've got quite a line-up of speakers now. We've got Councillor Simpson, Cashmore, Newman, Hills, Blair and Lee. Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and look, thank you for the work that you've put in today, so the feedback from the local boards and everything that we've got. It's a bit, bit hard to read the local board stuff, but I appreciate that they've given you that feedback and you've incorporated it. But my question is around... Um, trying to get this explained simply. I mean, it, it, you've, you're sending the document out, I agree with you, it, at the annual plan is the time to do it. Uh, but it's 37 pages long. And what I'm oh. um, sort of asking you is, and I don't want to create a whole lot of work for you, and maybe it's just... We're me. doing a short one, Councillor. It's on its way to being developed, and it's going to be how many pages, Andrew? That's what We're I'm aiming for five. Yeah, perfect. I thought we could just short circuit that question. <laughs> it just isn't quite yeah. done yet. Right. Thank a you. lot of work happening really fast. Councillor Cashmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Andrew, there's going to be no argument about water quality from Aucklanders. Everyone wants <coughs> better water. It's about when and how and who pays. Where in, is the national policy statement on water quality that Mr Parker is going to announce, I believe, also next year? This will fit into our actions programme. So that will potentially have quite a big influence. So any comment on that? So um, the, I think the, the priority catchments that, um, are, that Mr Parker is announcing, um, Dave, you could probably help answer this one. We have put forward those, <coughs> those catchments yeah, where nice. we've got good work programs in place. Um, and they're all catchments that have potential to be turned around within the time frame that Minister Parker went. Dave, do you have any... To add to that. Um, just to uh, reiterate, there's a, a quite a significant work program coming from central government next April. Uh, right. That's going to include a focus on both uh, at-risk catchments, but also um, a whole lot of things that might relate to urban areas, so stream loss um, and um, some of the provisions around wetlands. So there's a whole whole raft of things that are coming. Uh, sediment attribute. We'll cover some of that stuff off in the next presentation, but there's a lot of stuff coming. So. Um, I think Auckland Council will need to be quite mindful of that come round to about April next year. It'll be the interface of these three yep. things, yeah. so, so the values <coughs> framework is very much set up to try and align with that government framework, but also to put a uniquely Auckland focus on it as well. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Councillor Cashmore. Councillor Newman. Yeah, I think we're being a bit fluffy. Can we say this? Um, surface water is not a sufficient or sustainable source for supply. Groundwater is not a reliable nor sufficient source for supply. Dams are incredibly environmentally destructive and that the only reliable long-term option for the supply of potable water is to treat wastewater and to put that back into the water supply, the cost of which will be significantly higher than the present cost of supplying the region. Should we say that? Because mm. that's where it's going to end up, isn't it? So through the chair, um, wastewater recycling is certainly something that um, my colleagues from Watercare said that we need to think on the table. Um, and we have approached it very gently in the document because um, we looked to see what happened in the Gold Coast and the, the yuck factor started to dominate the public conversation over there and they shifted to a, a desal approach because they couldn't get the community over the line on 
the acceptability of <coughs> um, wastewater reuse. Um, and there's different opinions around in, in the engagement, but I think to paraphrase a lot of the um, feedback that we got, we need to make the best use and most efficient use of the water within our region as a priority. We should ha look at all options for future water sources. The future water source issue will come up at around 2050 based on the current demand projections. But we have to start thinking now for those very long lead in infrastructure projects. So that, um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd be hesitant personally to go straight in for the, uh, for the solution now, but um, this is where I think elected members can guide us um, for the political appetite to, to go there. Can I follow up, Chair? Yeah, sure. Thinking about what we can get within the region, we don't have a big river to consent to take more water from it. We don't have a dam that we can just go on and destroy the environment to dam for it. Um, we don't have reliable groundwater and surface supply. So I know that there is a yuck factor to it, and I know, but also desalination is a very, very expensive, very expensive option, completely not pragmatic in my view. So why aren't we front footing the issue? I mean, look, what ultimately we treat and put back into the supply is probably a lot cleaner than taking what we're getting from the Waikato River, which has been through about five cows' guts. So why don't we just say it? It has to come from treating wastewater and then reusing that. Mm. So can I suggest, rather than us debate that issue now, which we could spend the rest of the day on, I'm absolutely, totally in Councillor Newman's camp on this one, and I think part of the most useful piece of work that we can do is to actually start to educate people about the fact that we're a water stressed city and that we're going to need to start getting a social licence for doing things differently and um, I apologise for speaking, it's not necessarily the best thing for the chair but I think we could box that out as an example so at least we start that discussion happening and we start to develop that understanding because from a te ao Māori perspective, if we are respectful to Māori, we cannot keep looking at the Waikato pipeline as, a, as an option. And for the Waikato and for Tainui, it is entirely in their hands how they view that. And yes. therefore, it is a quid pro quo. <coughs> some very difficult discussions to have. And I think my personal view, and I think when Councillor Philip I and, a, and I distill what we've heard around this table, perhaps just getting a little bit more, <coughs> just pushing the boundaries a little bit more might be what we need. Um, council, I've got Councillor Hills, Member Blair, Lee, Casey, Brown and Fletcher, and hopefully that will be everybody. Councillor Hills. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, and uh, probably some of my comments can say for comments. but. Um, Questions wise, first of all, thank you. I know the, the work everyone's doing on the water strategy is pretty phenomenal and I've met on a lot of local issues and got really good response from everyone, so thank you. Um, but my concern is, and I spoke to you a little bit on the way here, Andrew, around uh, what are we gonna do on the compliance side a bit more, a bit stronger? Um, we can spend all this money and do all this great work and, and keep protecting everything, but actually, I still don't think we're getting the message across um, and maybe, you know, like Takapuna Beach, people putting their laundry straight into the, the um, stormwater drain has been an issue. The, the people's old pipes that they won't fix but still blame council for, for not fixing uh, certain issues. People um, shoving the uh, wet wipes down the drain and we're, I know we're, we're on a journey there but it's still not fast enough compared to the issues we're facing and it's ramping up. So we can spend a whole lot of money and keep raising money to spend money um, right across the city, but actually sometimes it's those smaller issues and I don't think we're tracking them back to people and actually finding them. Like, you know, people can look at the wider issue, but what are we doing on individuals and businesses to actually go, you're ruin ruining 
our city or you know we're never going to enhance the modi of the water if we keep allowing so sediment's one issue and you know trying to balance the fact we need housing and that sometimes there will be issues um and when we need to strengthen that but the individual stuff and the older our infrastructure on private property gets what what do we do because that's going to become a massive issue and i don't think it's really strong throughout the document so uh, through the chair yes i i agree i see that um in the compliance space, and I think um, the sediment paper from NES is a, is a good example of this, we, we've got a lot of existing rules and process in place already, and it's about the focus that we put um, on that compliance and monitoring and the effort that we put towards it. Um, I guess the, those are the things that can happen now and soon. But thinking of where the strategy will go in terms of landing something for the next LTP, I, I sort of see the, the home for that compliance and monitoring and creating our future, water future together. We had, um, I've, I've seen up on the end of the slide, you know, the polluter pays principle, and I look, reflect on um, parking metre wardens. Now, a lot of people will uh, park wherever they like, and they'd park for as long as they wanted to if they had no fear of getting caught. But, you know, if you park anywhere for too long in Auckland, you'll get, you'll get pinged. And... In a similar way, people approach, you know, personal responsibility with water. If you're not going to get caught, you know, if it's convenient, you just tip something down the drain. Um, and I think uh, this is a step on the place of how can we sustainably fund the level of compliance and monitoring we would like, because it's a straight hit on OPEX. So if we've got yeah. it, I think, you know, what we're trying to find today, what are the things we need to have in here that provide a hook for that discussion? Yeah. We're not going to answer it all in here. We just know. need the hook to be there. Mm. So and I think it's there. Yeah, and the other hook, and I guess it probably is in here, Madam Chair, but hook and transport, I guess, I'm more and more depressed with some of our monitoring and operational stuff and I, around us taking the lead and whoever's responsible for that. It's our streets, it's the cigarette butts, it's the lack of... Uh, maintenance that actually tells the public if we don't care why should they care and it's all connected if every drop of water is connected if we're talking in a Maori sense of the word every single bit of what we're doing is a waste of time if we're not showing leadership too so I want to know how this is being stressed on the other operational side of things as well thank you okay. Member Blair. Kia, ora. Kia ora Andrew and the team um, the board supports a strategic and cohesive approach um, to water across all areas of council involvement. Um, get that diverse thinking and that cohesion, then dare I say it, we might even have a long-term view on how water is going to be uh, dealt with in the city. And um, recognise councils alone as resource and responsible for Auckland rates-based responses and investments. So we're, we're, we're glad this is going out to the public forum um, and Te Māori to Tawai is really important. Um, someone who does live on a bit of water tank, water, you know, you certainly know during summer about conservation and, and where it comes from. Um, but my, my big question that I want to ask, I've got two questions. What's your current view on the supply of water to Auckland? What, what's the risk there? Uh, so through the chair, um, Based on the demand projections and what we have consent, what Watercare have got an existing consent for, and what's in the con pipeline for future consents from the Waikato, supply should meet demand up until 2050 for the municipal area. But there's some communities that will reach that much sooner, and Helensville is a really good example of that as a, in a as a case study. So Helensville, um, the decision for that, that more growth has been enabled in Helensville. It won't, it'll reach um, the water limit faster. And this is where the strategic decision to reticulate or not gets very interesting. So if you put a pipeline from the municipality out to Helensville, does that suddenly open up growth all the way along that pipeline in that rural area, which we didn't really forecast before? Or perhaps we should move to Councillor Newman's um, suggestion that Let's relocate the treatment plant out of the, the climate change inundation area and start recycling the wastewater in Helensville and putting it back in. So there's that community, and that, that serves as a really interesting 
early look at what the decisions as a municipality we're going to face. So we, so, okay, so the supplies, I think those key messages are really important to people mm. to understand that in 2050 we're going to have some real issues and being born and bred in Helensville I've got a pretty um, concern about that area to tell the truth. Uh, the other part is the potable, what's your current thinking on the potable water? Where, where are the opportunities? So, um, through the Chair, so I think um, we certainly can do better on efficiency, although Aucklanders are already the most efficient water users in the country. So that's something that we shouldn't take our, our foot off, and water care are really behind that, keep promoting efficient water use and managing leakage. Um, wastewater recycling has absolutely got to be up there as an as option we should consider. Um, there has often, there's been a number of studies for a dam in the north, and um, that would have to be part of an option consideration because the north is also some of the most vulnerable to the climate change effects of uh, less rainfall and drought. But we've also got a number of water sources that we're not maximising. So if you think of the Hayes Creek Dam in Papakura, um, currently that's um, been mothballed. But as part of the philosophy of making best use of the water within the region, it's not the full solution, but we should be using as all of these different sources and efficiency so that we are dependent on the Waikato that we can go hand on heart to, to Tainui and say, look, we're not squandering the resources in our own region before we ask you for more. And is it, sorry, the final, as a statement, oh, I just want to get the, the figures right, but I heard that Sydney's got five years of st storable water, and how long has Auckland got? Nine Approximately months. nine months. Nine months, okay. Thank you, before it turns to mayhem. And these are really important facts for Aucklanders to understand. Mm. Sadly, every time we try and have that discussion, it falls for five days and people lose sight of it. Councillor Lee. Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of concerns about this, Madam Chair. Um, the discussion document, I take it, is, is meant uh, for Auckland citizens, everyone in Auckland. And I'm just a little bit concerned that the emphasis all the way through um, is very much on Maori concerns, the Maori worldview, um, mana whenua concerns, which all of us respect. But there's more to water than one culture. Um, it's, it's a common need for all of humanity, for all living things, in fact. And if we're going out to um, ask the public um, to be involved, I think we need to and be a little bit more inclusive when it comes to um, public communication. <coughs> Leaving that aside, the most important concern I have is that there's no trace in here of the notion of sustainability. Uh, indeed, the Resource Management Act. And despite what I, I thought I heard one of the officers suggest earlier on, is that the provision of water um, is not a matter of, or clean water, is not a matter of balance. It's compulsory under the Resource Management Act, of which there is no trace under Section 5, um, the purposes of the Act, uh, safeguarding the life supporting capacity of air, water, soil, and ecosystems. Bottom line, no if or, or buts or balances or trade-off, that's the bottom line. And I don't see uh, enough emphasis on that. If anything is subject to the sustainability question and endangered by ignoring sustainability, it is water. And water is a common need of all people, the rich and the poor of every race in the city on this planet. So can we start talking a little bit more to all Aucklanders and, I'm sorry to say this, but reduce the political correctness a wee bit. That's a, that's a, a plea. Thank you. I
Councillor Philip Iona and I will try and give effect to some of your comments, Councillor, but it is really clear as our treaty partner and our partner in this process that Te Ao Māori and the Māori world view around water is probably the clearest and most coherent view, and in my mind, I'm talking to our Kaitiaki Forum, who've helped us form this, it is more coherent, in fact, than the RMA, because it is absolute. So, you know, call it political correctness, I call it te ao Māori, and I, I think we hear you, but I'm not too sure whether there is a mood around the table to change, and I Call certainly don't Waitangi. hear that coming. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't hear that coming from um, our treaty partner, Councillor Casey. Oh, because it's water, I've got a hard water question and a soft water question. I'll do the hard one first. Hard like I. Just as we produced a wonderful unitary plan, we now have the spectre of Phil Twyford's <coughs> Urban Development Agency. While we're producing, or we're about to start work on this wonderful, you know, it's a wonderful document. I enjoyed the workshop. I think it's great what we're doing, but I've got the spectre of Nanaya Mahuta and the Three Waters Review. And if you look at your risks section, Andrew, you tell us that, quote, the strategy will need to adapt to any changes in direction from central government. Well, just can you just expand on that for me? Because here we are um, seeking advice, um, creating a document, how, how, how are we that agile? And also you say the mitigation is to anticipate where possible <laughs> what's going to happen. I mean, good luck with that. Yep. Okay. Um, through the year, the cabinet paper for the DIA has come out. Um, and I guess uh, listening to the, uh, the Minister of Local Government, they've strongly shadowed uh, increased regulation around potable water but they haven't really settled on the aggregation of water utilities and taking um, water utilities from local government control they've sort of talked about the voluntary measures and and water care already operate beyond Auckland's um, boundaries they provide water services to Tuakau and into Pokino so we're sort of already operating across regions in some respects. Um, yes, we haven't hit that issue head on in this, in this discussion document. Um, we didn't think that the central government position had been clarified that much. However, this once again, elected members feel strongly that we should raise this flag in this paper. I think it's something that we should certainly do. Well, yes, I, I heard the chair say earlier it wasn't strong enough. That's my feeling. This, this is what we would do if there wasn't the Naya Mahuta worrying about what's going to happen to New Zealand's water and how we're going to deliver it. But that's on the political agenda, and we can't not have something in there. Now, you know, I'll seek advice from my colleagues, but that, that was my fear as well. I'm the soft questions can come later. I'm saying nodding around the table, Councillor. It might be one that we have a go at. You know, the questions could range from how do Aucklanders feel about cross-subsidising the cost of water and infrastructure to the far north, which is probably a little bit incendiary, <laughs> through to, um, you know, what are your views on the um, amalgamation of water services in the North Island? Or, you know, we'll, we'll play around with a question we can add, but I, I, my personal view is I agree with you. I think we do need to sort of raise the flag around what might be happening. And again, as I answer to Councillor Newman, you can yeah. box this out as an example of some of the challenges we're facing. Great. The soft um, question yeah. is just um, how we address, uh, and uh, Councillor Simpson raised the issue of a shorter version with clearer directions, but I'm looking for the cartoon version for kids with lots of pictures of Hector's dolphins and and threatened species, and you have included it. You have included it. I've seen the boxes in here, but um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from the next generation. And for them to offer their opinions, they need to be asked the right questions in clean language. So I'm, I'm hoping that you're, you're, you've got another version apart from the five <laughs> pages. It's just one page with lots of pictures for kids. 
Uh, certainly, we try our, try our best to summarise it. Um, it gets it gets quite blunt when you bring it right down to those mm. levels. So um, that that is certainly a, a work in progress. But um, there's a lot of graphics that are being worked up, and we are um, working with the comms and engagement team to look at um, particularly engaging directly with some schools in and around the water month and launch of the strategy of, of the discussion document. Sorry. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Great ideas. Member Brown. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, I just want to pick up a couple of things but, uh, because they stimulate, aroused my interest. Um, and you've said it yourself, so, you know, I'm looking for a strategy. You know, when you talk about the Māori worldview, that serves to unify the silos that have this peripheral influence, if not consequence. So you mentioned earlier um, the water, but then we need to build 3,000 houses. Um, there needs to be more roads. These are my words. Um, I think the Māori worldview is uh, that's fine, as long as it's all responsible, it's enduring <coughs> and sustainable, we can talk about anything. So what I don't see is a unification on the significant taonga called water that whether it likes it or not still has to have this consideration about the periphery. So I am concerned around uh, in part what could be an excuse to blame the Māori world view because we're not getting it right. And after 178 years we're at a strategy, yet it's actually been the Crown's right in that period. So to some degree, why should Māori accept the current status of what it is because it didn't pollute it, it didn't ruin it, and yet we're applying our principles and values to it for over 200 ethnicities, as Councillor Lee put it, may be difficult to read. The reality is they are the principles and values of Māori associated to that element. And I'm really keen to hear all 200 ethnicity values and principles uh, to the same thing. I agree that it's the right of all human. That aside, how do you propose in this strategy to control these conflicts because to have Modi or to why, the best way to describe that would be the rainfall at the top of Hūnua or Waitakere that hits the ground is why puhi, why water, the purity of the water and its arrival. But when it gets to the mouth of the Wairoa River into Te Kapa Moana, it's why mate, it's dead water, it's sick water. But between the top and that mouth, are a whole range of us who affect all of these things. So whether it's housing or roading or whatever it is, how are you guys going to strategize to unify all of your strategies, then your pending plans that arguably are going to continue and perpetuate the last 178 years? And I keep going back to it. The standards of stormwater runoff and heavy rainfall. So all of this good stuff and one rainfall can be just washed into the Waitemata or the Manuka or the Kaipara or wherever because it's just a strategy. So I want to go and end with the compliance bit which is really where the rub is on the road for me. So while we're sitting here we've heard about the small development effects that largely look unmanaged, uncontrolled that continue to go on, and the example was Flatbush. And the percentages up against that small development effect were quite significant, but they remain unmanaged. And these are my words. And so far as the scale that it seems to be now, and that's just one development subword of many. So how does the strategy connect through a plan into compliance whereby Aucklanders can see the flat-out penalties when we get it wrong. 
how does you know how does compliance have a real flat out message to 1.5 Aucklanders when you get it wrong this is what's going to happen because until the strategy starts being honest in that way then arguably I um, feel like I'm participating in perpetuating the status quo Kilda I just my okay. question was is there a strategy <laughs> that so unifies all of these silo strategies that all affect each other because you're sitting there um, quite openly disclosing conflict. So I want to know how that's going to be captured and managed, if at all. Can I, I'll just give our staff a break for a moment, James. That's the point I was trying to make in my opening statements around the connection between the three. our climate change yep. plan, our water plan, and our sediment strategic approach. And it is our job to actually bring these together because there's compliance that drops out of each of these because one affects the other. There's funding that's required to make each of these work. And that's what the LTP discussion that we, we have to have. And there's also a social license that hopefully this project is out to seek because for instance, when someone is building a house and we give them a tough time about building in a floodplain and say, you don't really want to do that, they're allowed to do it under the, under the RMA. And they sure as heck come to their local council to say, healthy waters is being difficult yet again, please help us get our building consent. If we have a strong enough social license to say, we are no longer going to tolerate that kind of behavior, that drives compliance, that drives funding to make sure that compliance is enforced and that tells the community why we're toughening up. At the moment, we are t far too siloed to make that happen. So, sorry, it's a political answer because I think this is, we're, we're traversing now into our ability to act with a bit of political strength. So, bottom line, we are attempting to bring those silos together, but we need to give the political license to do so. Councillor Fletcher. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Are we are we in questions or are we speaking as we, well? Uh, what we're doing is the questions are giving... They're actually kind of useful feedback for Andrew and the team to to take on board as we make some changes to the plan, so... Andrew, um, I think uh, it would be interesting to you, for you to confirm why Aucklanders are the most efficient users of water in the country. And I suspect your answer is going to be because we were the first to actually put a value on water. And if we were the first on that, I think we should be taking the lead in this document. And the, the question um, that I really want the answer to is that we're about to use the budget of $500,000 that was allocated for this, half a million dollars, so we want to make sure that this consultation is meaningful. And um, I, I, I guess I'm feeling a little bit that we, we've workshopped this so long that we've almost turned it in, into motherhood and apple pie. And um, that's in no way disrespect to the officers. It's probably just the, the, the way in which you've tried to capture all of the views uh, of, of the elected members and the IMSB and, but I, I guess what I'm really keen to see, and, and we are told that there is this document that's going to be forthcoming, it's going to be no more than five pages, and we do want to see clarity around it. But if we're going to spend $500,000, I do want to see the hard questions being answered. Um, so before I allow Andrew to respond to that, Madam Chair, I wonder whether you would be willing um, to include in those that is, you, we, we are going to give you the, the responsibility along with the Deputy Chair um, to scrutinise this. But I would like you to have a think about including Councillor Newman, who has long taken an interest in water, um, because I think we do need to sharpen up on some of these really hard questions. But Andrew, do you want to respond in, in terms of, um, you, you, you've got uh, paragraph 23 and 24, and they they really are the, we, we come to the essence of what we're trying to do with those, and we need to sharpen those up. So how how could we, 
address those in a more meaningful way to justify half a million dollars worth of consultation? So, um, so Chair, yes, I absolutely agree. We work very hard to try and balance all of the views and I guess the agreeable document that you have is, is a result of that. Um, and, that and, I, and, and I'll repeat that having stronger direction, political direction to ask those more pointed questions helps because um, you know, some of them are the more difficult, potentially conflicting things, you know, <coughs> brings us up against some of the tightly held views within the, the council group. So absolutely welcome your direction to be more pointed and more specific about some of those difficult questions. And I, but I would emphasize that uh, at this stage, it's a discussion document, exactly. that it's not trying to say we're locking in a council policy just yet. You've got the opportunity to absorb that public feedback and think about it before you um, settle on a, the, the full strategy and the policy. But, but we're not going to really, as elected members, we're not going to arrive at what, what we might use to give us a mandate unless we are a little bit more direct in the questions we are asking. Mad Madam Chair, did you give some consideration to oh, the inclusion of that for new I, I, I'm oh. absolutely happy, and um, <laughs> I, I just warn elected members, probably this is one area that Councillor Newman and I are on exactly the same page. In fact, I'm more <laughs> radical like than Councillor Newman. You, you know, beware what you ask for, because we, we would we really do want to ask the hard questions. Exactly. We'll moderate our enthusiasm, and I'm, I know, and I'm sure the Deputy Chair's the same. It'd be great to have Councillor Newman as part of this, but let's not lose sight of, we also want to, we might have workshopped this to death, Aucklanders haven't. This is actually Aucklanders' chance to understand the complexities of water, to catch up with us, and for them to push some of the buttons and ask the hard questions. We need to give them the information. But if you want it firmed up and toughened up, I'm well up for that. So let's, we'll add Councillor Newman in there. You're fine with that, Councillor Philip Heiner? Awesome. Yeah, we can have the whole right. 20 of them. Finally, to <laughs> No, we, we can't do that before Christmas. <laughs> Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm sure you, I wanted to ask, because I, I mentioned earlier, I said that I felt it was seeking validation. And I, I would argue that we already have validation through um, the water quality rate discussion uh, um, and support for that. But anyway, um, I wanted to know uh, how will we close the loop then? Because we're going to start this discussion. How do we close the loop once we have our full water strategy actions policy back to Aucklanders? And I would also support uh, using this as an opportunity to seek the mandate of Aucklanders about local government maintaining control yeah. uh, of um, yeah. Through the chair, I think the uh, if you get the timing right, in June 2020, it arrives just before the hard thinking on the 2021 LTP is put in place. So I think um, if we can articulate those programs of work well, uh, what you put forward for the 2021 LTP will really show some definitive action about wh where you want to head with the, uh, str with the strategy. There's nothing like asking people um, to pay for the objectives to really make it real. And I guess my last point will be picked up by yourself and okay. Deputy and Councillor Newman. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Bartley. And last quick question or comment, Councillor Walker. It isn't a question. I'm happy to move and I'd like to speak to it, Madam Chair. Just tell me when. Now. Okay. So um, I'm entirely supportive of getting this strategy out. It's critical that we have an integrative strategy across Council because right now water is approached in a siloed way across a whole variety of departments and that also includes water care. We're behind the game. We're behind other cities that do have water strategies. When you have a water strategy, and fundamentally one of the approaches here is a catchment scale thinking and action approach, you then realise that Auckland actually has an abundance of water. It has an abundance of potable water that's falling from the sky on an incredibly regular basis. In fact, 
much more regularly than most cities on the planet, but we don't use it well. So we have a phenomenal opportunity here. I would suggest that this strategy is complementary to the Māori world view of water and that of many traditional societies and that of our current society. We just need to move with the times. So let's get this out. If there is a way to deal with some of the provocative um, issues that we might want to raise, then by all means populate it with some examples. Yeah. What if this? What if that? What if the other? That's a way of dealing with that and also making the process a little bit more dynamic so that people can feed in and there can be some open discussion on this issue. I think that would be incredibly useful. So I'm totally supportive of this. Let's get it out and make a great job of it. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Filipaina. Just very quickly, just um, the fact that we have um, uh, water care, uh, transport, um, and also referenced in here, the Kaitiaki group, I think, is an indication in regards to how we are going to work and break down those silos. So um, just to confirm what uh, Wayne said, I'm looking forward again, as always, for it to go out for consultation. Then let's have a look at the workshop because we've had, and people have spoken about that, we've had quite a few workshops on it and it's now waiting to see what uh, our community says to come back to us. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor. So we've taken on board everything that's been raised. Um, we will hold the pen on a little bit more oomph and a tiny bit of radicalisation <coughs> and... Hopefully, we'll get Aucklanders well engaged in this. No more speakers? I'm going to put the recommendation. All in those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. And can I just warmly thank um, Auckland yep. Transport, Water Care, our own fantastic internal teams for pulling this together. I don't underestimate at all the tension that's existed to get where we've got to. So please take back our thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.